All right, so we're going to go over gameplay for Robin Hood, and we should just give a little warning, like because we usually mention it when we do it with worker placement games. We're going through every possible thing that you can do in this game. Right. So it's going to be long, but don't let that deter you, because when you play the game, it actually you're going to want to know what this stuff does. Right. And honestly, I feel like there's a lot of things that we tried to take a guess at, and we were off base yeah. with some of the symbols and stuff so if if you're a, a visual and you want to watch type of learner rather than trying to retain everything in the rule book right. you might want to watch this this whole portion what Jeb um, I think he's gonna do he'll stop me he'll cut this all out if it's wrong but I think we're gonna go and explain an entire round to you and then we'll go one by one place in each thing and show you exactly how it does a work yeah. And it's not that bad because each round only consists of two phases. Yeah, so. but I, exactly. Yeah. All right, so like I just said, uh, there's two phases per round, and this game is played over five rounds. That is not going to change. It's always five rounds with two phases each. Okay, so just so you know, we used the wrong thing for first player token. This is not the first player token. It is the round tracker that goes down here. The fancy little metal coin that I got is the first player token. So I have that, and the first player token moves along the track like, like this. There's five rounds, so it starts with... Um, Merry uh, Men phase? Merry Men phase, hero phase. Merry Men phase, hero phase. Merry Men phase, hero phase. Yep. There's also the villains do stuff during... The hero phase. During the hero phase, so you'll see all that. So they don't really need a tracker because it's incorporated in. Yeah. Alright, so let's start with the Merry Men phase, since you know how all the rounds work now. <laughs> so, Merry Men phase, the players are going to take turns placing meeples in the eight different locations on the board. Okay, uh, so let's point to the locations. One, two, three, three four, five, six, six, seven... Seven, eight. Seven and eight. Uh, the way... They're, what they, they did is the places that you can place meeples are the Merry Men symbol. Yes. So that's how you know where you can place, or where a meeple's supposed to go, and then the Robin Hood hat is where heroes go. And then there are places that actually have multiple symbols in the same spot. Right, and so anything can move there. We actually, the once you understand the symbols and stuff, everything starts to come together really well. For instance... Notice in the hideout, only you can only place Married. merry men, but in the uh, common area, which is probably not what they call gathering area, I guess they call it. This is hideout. This is gathering area. Main the area. sheriff, or bad guy symbol rather, merry men and heroes yep. can occupy the, those spaces. All right, and I guess we should probably be official with the names of the sites. Yeah. So the armories up top. Got a picture of a crossbow, and or a bow and sword, sorry. The workshop's down here. Workshop's got a picture of an anvil. Woodcutter's cut. It's got a picture of a, a chopping block. Woodcutter's hut. I don't know if I might have said cut. Uh, the church is down here. Has a picture of a church. Iron forge. Has a picture of uh, molten iron being poured in, poured in, poured into the mold. <laughs> <laughs> the town square is in the very center. Town Square is right here. The construction yard. Construction yard is this one, right? Yep, it has a hammer. Yep. Uh, above the. This is the. Place. Yeah, I got the right one. Yep. And then King Richard's Crusade is up at the top. And that has a banner. It has a banner up here, and it has the spot for the meeples here. All right. So those are all the different places you can place meeples. And as Mickey already said, there's. A main area and a hideout. So the entire thing is called a gathering site, but this portion is the main area, and each of these little boxes are the hideouts. The main area can hold unlimited meeples, and then the hideouts can hold only one meeple. So uh, you can't place a meeple if there's a guard there, and you have to place top to bottom, which is really key. Yeah, it really is because like the way that things fill up, that's that's really uh, during setup, that's very key to why they said three and four um, guards. And you'll see during gameplay why that matters. Alright, so for the Merry Men phase, you're going to place a meeple. 
and then you're going to play a Merry Man card. You're going to resolve the action, and then the next player does that. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the woodcutter hut. Nope. I mean, wrong thing. Yep. I don't know why I grabbed Robin because he's big. All right. All right. So there's for, two examples uh, that we need to show you. So which is the first one that you want? I will go ahead and go to the hideout first. All right. So he's going to the hideout. He's going to place his meeple on the very top, the topmost hideout that's available. Right. And now I must play a card. Right. Okay. So to play a, play a card, you can either play it actively or passively. To play it actively, you look at... Um, you, you play the card on the right side of your player board, and then you activate what's on the left side of the card. That probably, <laughs> when I said it, probably was like, that's confusing. All right, so play on the left side of my, I mean the right side of my card, activate the left side of this. Yeah. So as you'll notice, it has the woodcutter symbol, or I wouldn't be able to do this, right. and then I instantly get whatever it says. In this case, I get two wood resources. Right. So I would gather the two resources and I would put them in there. All right. My other option is to play the card passively. If I play the card passively, I go into the center. So he would go into the the main area. And I place it on the left side of my player board. And now that just sits there. Okay? The key to remember is that while it's sitting there, it's uh, it's potentially worth victory points at the end of the game because you it has a victory point on the right hand side of the card which only gets used if it's in the passive column at the end of the game okay the uh, second thing is that that is now available on future turns to what are used as to an active to card. be used as an active card so instead of taking a card from my hand like I just did on a future turn I could do the exact same thing that we just showed you, except I could move him from passive to active, and that counts as playing my card right. also. So I just wouldn't do something from my hand. And hopefully that wasn't too con confusing, We're, and we are going to explain what every yeah. site does later. Just a quick thing. Main area, you place your meeple, and you have to make it passive. Mm -hmm. If you put it in a hideout, then you play the card, it needs to be active. Right, you can't go to the hideout unless you, if unless you have something to do, correct? Right, right. So, um, and if you if you go into the middle, you still get whatever the generic. Yes, yeah, so that's the next part. Right. After you play your card, you're going to resolve the action. So in this case, he's Mickey's going to collect the resource, which I did. So the, the two. It, since he was in the hideout and he played the active card, it says to collect two. If it was in the main area, however. Right next to the symbol for the main area, or the gathering site, it says how much he would collect, which is just one wood. And remember, that's the passive action. That's the passive. Also, while we're talking about playing these cards, because it's important that you understand, every single time you do this, you must play a card. Yes, every time you play some meeple, you must play a Merry Man card. Right, no matter what. And if, the, and if that sounds confusing, don't forget, you can always play something passively. Right. doesn't matter where you you go if you don't have um so i could play this woodcutter card on the church and just make it passive right okay i can't go into the hideout because it's and not. get two wood because it's not the woodcutter's place right okay so we'll go through all the, the the different gathering sites and tell you what you do there when you place the meeple so first up is the armory armory number one right here Yep, and you would get a if weapon can, die. Right, so the passive, if you go into the gathering area, the passive action is take any one of these die you want. Yep. Uh, the workshop, which is down here, when you go there, the passive is to get, to get one tool resource. Uh, the woodcutter's hut is where Mickey went, and that's where you get the wood. One wood resource going in the the main area with the passive. The church is you get a distraction token. The iron forge, you get an iron ore. Yep. Yeah, the ore. If you go to the town square, 
when you place in the town square, you you attempt to rob. rob. So what's going to happen is you're going to take skill dice equal to the number of arrows, and you're going to roll them and try to get a success. So to begin with, you take three skill dice, and you're trying to get a success. Those are the three. If I roll, I got one success. That's all I was trying to do. Yep. So now Mickey can either choose to take one loot from the loot bag, or he can press his luck. If he presses his luck, he goes down to two skill dice, and, and he has to get one success. Right. Look at that, he got it. So he can press his luck or take two loot tokens, since he succeeded in the second one. If he presses his luck, he would have to just roll one, and then, and, I fall, and then I don't get anything. Yes. If you fail at any point, you lose, or you don't get any loot tokens. So, Jeb, what happens if I fail right. on that, like I did on that last one? <laughs> so, if you fail, you don't get any loot. So, if he, Mickey had pressed on all the way to the end, he still gets nothing because he was. It's pressing your luck. Uh, when you fail, though, you place your meeple in level one jail <laughs> and pay one possession to the sheriff's stash. If you don't have a possession to pay, you go to level two of the jail. I so guess, there's my meeple. So if I had right there, still in the woodcutter thing, show them oh, our level one. So if Mickey had went there, did the test, and failed, he would go to level one, which is right here. And then there's level two here, level three here, and then the hangman. You gotta go to the gallows. <laughs> yeah. So since Mickey failed, places meeple here, and then now he must take. One of the possessions in his on his player board, and it goes to the sheriff's And stash. I put it in the sheriff's stash. If he did, had nothing, he'd be in level 2 jail, right. which is not good. So, no, you're just closer to dying. Point. We talked about gathering resources. This was robbing the rich. So the, another place you can go is making a barricade or trap. All right, so that is the, uh, did you call it the construction site? Construction yard, yep. Yep, construction yard. Again, a symbol for a merry man. So put a merry man there. And then... <clears throat> I the have, merry man card that you play must have the symbol for that area. Right. And there's two symbols. So this one, with the it's brown with... Uh, it's like a banner with, with three... three well, three shapes on it. Basically, it means barricades. Yeah. And the other one is green with uh, spikes coming up from it. And that's a trap. So but, this is trap, this is barricade. And the Merry Man cards actually have that Those symbol so next to it. So you, if you play a Merry Man card with a trap, you can't play or you can't build a barricade. A, hopefully you guys can see that. There's the trap. There's the. Okay, uh, so that one has both on it. The, I'm sorry, trap, barricade. Only one of them though is giving me a discount. Right. I can still go there and do the one that doesn't have a discount, but it's going to cost me more. And we'll explain that in just a second. Yep, so when you place your meeple there, you're going to play the Merryman card, and what you're going to do is spend resources to the supply and silver penny to the road if the silver penny is part of the cost. So you pay the cost, and you can build the barricade or the trap. Okay, so I'll go over this side first. This is the trap. So it's the green symbol. Again, you play the card with the green symbol. If it's a discount, don't forget to take your discount into consideration. But then you go down and you look, where's the place that I want to build? Pick a place, Jeb. Where do I want to put a trap? The church. Okay, so I find the church symbol. Look right here. The church says it costs me two ore and one worker token to be able to put a trap there. If I pay those costs, I take trap from the far left of my board. And that's key, the far left. Right, because you're going to unlock stuff as you go along. And I place it top to, or the first unoccupied, right. unoccupied by guard, a guard, by a guard. Yeah. So you can put a trap with a merry man because the merry man knows about the trap, yeah. but the guards don't. Okay, so just like Jeb did there, that's all that's to it. What's interesting to note, I'm sure you can probably, if you can't see exactly what it is, you'll notice that each particular place has a different cost, yep. which makes it very interesting because once you see the gameplay, stuff randomly comes out, and you're going to have, and 
you might not have the resources where you really, really need it. So you're going to have to take that into consideration with what you do during your turn. Okay, so the next part is the barricades. In a very, very similar manner, make sure that this brown symbol is on the card. Play the card. Make sure you don't miss any discounts. If it has one, look at North, East, South, West Road. Pick one that you want to build on. I'll say this road here. I look up here. This is the West Road. I want to build on the West Road. I go down and I look at West. Okay. Oh, almost the exact same thing. Cost me two ore, one tool, tool and one silver. However, when I pay for that, put the tokens back into the common thing, but I take the piece of silver and I put it on the road. Right. Okay? That That's, that's important, too. <laughs> yes. And one thing to note about the traps and the barricades, when you oh. take... Yeah, when you... Well, first, when you place a barricade, it has to be the farthest away from open the castle. space away from the castle. Another thing is, as you're taking traps and barricades off your player board, uh, when you pull it off, there might be a little symbol underneath, mm -hmm. and then you gain whatever that is immediately. Right. All right, so uh, this is for the barricades. Okay. The first slot is no reward. Right. The second slot is gain a silver penny at the beginning of each round. Oh, okay. The third one is gain a distraction token at the beginning of each round. Yeah. Fourth is gain a weapon die at the beginning of each round. Those are huge. And the fifth is immediately unlock the fourth hideout on your player board, removing the green token, and transfer one Merry Man from the training grounds. Okay. You can now use this additional Merry Man throughout the game. Okay. When you take me meeples to place on the board, you take them from the hideouts. Right. So. All right, and then let's go over the traps. First one, no reward. Second is gain a resource of your choice at the beginning of each round. The third one is draw a loot token at the beginning of each round. Fourth is draw one extra Merry Man card at the beginning of each round. Your hand limit is now five instead of four. And then the last one is immediately unlock the fourth hideout. So I guess uh, it's the exact same as the other one. I, so. I felt like I read something somewhere that said if you've already done it. If you've you got already unlocked it, ignore the reward the second time you reveal it. The last place that you can place a meeple is sending the envoy, which is King Richard's Crusade space. Which is this very top with the banner. Alright, so the Merry Man card has the symbol. You have to play the card to, that has that. Uh, what you're going to do is spend resources, and any resource, or any of the silvers that you pay go to uh, the roads. So I, I put it you, wherever you want. Yep. And then this meeple is not returned and is uh, used for the in-game victory point. Right. So he's literally out of the game from now on. And he, this, there's a cost on here that are at, is actually weapons. So you actually have to... Oh, two weapons. Two, two weapons, two silver, silver and two, and two resources. So I guess it's like you can pretend like you're bringing... Like, this guy's leaving on a crusade. He's taking his weapons yep. with him. That's kind of the, the visual I get. You can do that a maximum of three times per player. Or you can only have three meeples on that area per player. Because they are connected to your king task cards. So if you remember in the beginning of the game each player got three task cards. Uh, when you at the end of the game if you have a meeple out uh, as an envoy you can score one of your task one cards. Of your cards. So that's why you, the three maximum because you only have three task cards. And that's about everything you can do with your meeple. Right. So Mickey would have placed his meeple, then it goes to the player to his left, and then to the left, and then it goes all the way around until nobody has any meeples left on their player board in their hideouts to place. And at that point, you advance the round marker to the next phase. So and then this would, would go to the hero phase. So, one last thing that before we move to the hero phase, if we didn't say it, you're pulling your meeples from the hideout on your resource card and not from the training ground. I kind of think that's obvious because they're the ones that are in the little uh, squares, but in case it wasn't, you know, so when you start the game, you get three placements and you can earn the fourth one right. later. And as you can see, you can lose the meeple. Um, so you, that's why there's three extra during the game. Between going here and maybe being stuck in jail, right. you have to 
manage your you know, you, you are limited to six throughout the game, but you you'll can see, manage it. Yeah, and later on you'll see how you get more, or you get yeah. them back and yeah. everything. So, All right, so let's move on to the hero phase. During the hero phase, you're going to draft weapons and activate heroes, and the bad guys are going to activate as well. So the first thing that happens is drafting weapons. So the first player is going to take a weapon of their choice from the, the dice pool up there, and then the next player is going to take one, and then all the way around till everybody's taken one, and then it snakes back so everybody gets another one. And the key is you can only have a maximum of four dice. And if you don't know what snake back means, that means the last player basically is going to draw two, and then it goes in reverse order. So, for example, Mickey's first player, he would take one, and then I'm next, so I take one. And there's no other player, so since I'm the last, I get to take another one. And then it goes back to Mickey to take one. Now we're done And drafting. that's done drafting. So drafting, you only get two. Like, there's no way to get more right. Unless draft. you got to take that action if you want more dice. Great. All right, so once all the heroes, or once all the players have drafted, it's going to be the hero turn. And what this consists of is drawing a villain card. Ugh. And this is where things get nasty. So, you want to draw a villain card? I will draw a villain card, Jeb. All right. We'll draw a villain card. Let's just look at that villain card. Yep. So, the first thing is placing a guard. All right. So. And it tells you where to place it. I have one guard that goes to the woodcutter spot. All right. So, we are going to grab a guard. And where's the woodcutter spot? Over here. Yep. You are going to place that guard in the topmost spot, working your way down. Uh, a couple of things to note, if there is no space to place the guard, so if all of these were full and Mickey had to place one and he couldn't, this would get placed over on the guard track. If you were to place a guard on top of a trap, uh, what would happen is the trap and the guard are taken off the board and goes to that player's lair and can be returned at the end of the hero phase for a ransom. So if this was placed over here, Mickey would get both the trap and the guard. And then that's where that card comes in is when Jeb's talking about ransom. Not yet, not yet but, but yeah. it can happen. And no, this does not go and cover up the space it came off. <laughs> right. um, and then another one. Before Jeb goes on, just as a, if this ever gets full, you guys lose. Yep, since we talked, to, since we started talking about this, I'm going to throw that in there. Yep. Um, another example is if the guard is placed on a space you know, on a hideout that has a merry man. If this guard was placed over here, and my merry man is there, what's going to happen is, all right, I would pay a possession. So let's just say I have this wood right here. I would place it next to the guard and my meeple. And if I can't, I would go to level one prison. And what this is kind of setting up for is that meeple can be rescued later on. So if you don't have a possession, you're in big trouble. Right. If you have a possession, you have a chance for the hero to rescue you. Right. And that's it for placing the guard. So next up on the card is okay, next, placing next one, the villain. The, the next one is the villain. And in my case, I have a star. All right. The star represents the sheriff. Okay. So the symbols are... A star for the sheriff, a crown for Prince John, and I forget the other guy's name. Guy of Gisborne? Yeah. It looks like, uh, what is it, the metal like a vest? breastplate? Oh, a breastplate, thing. okay. So those are the three symbols, so that's how you know who to move. I got a star, so the sheriff's moving. Uh, so the sheriff. when the sheriff moves, he places two guards, and he doesn't affect any merry man at the location. All right, so... Uh, he's going to the There's blacksmith or whatever they call it on this game. All right, so he goes into the middle. Yep. He, he doesn't go ever go directly into a hideout or anything. All right. But he's bringing two guards with him. Oh, and look what happens. So, can't place here because there's a guard here. So the next empty spot we can place one. Oh, wait. He places two. So if you can count, there's four. <laughs> And this guy can't be placed anywhere, so guess where he goes? He gets to go up to the trap. Oh, oh, now we're only four spaces away from losing the game. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right, so uh, what is it, Guy of Gisborne? What he does is he goes on a road and removes a barricade closest to the castle. All right, so this guy, this is Guy of Gisborne. He gets placed. His action is always to go on one of these roads. The card will tell you. And if he went on this road, guess what? That's popping off. Yep. And then also, if there was a carriage that that barricade was stopping at the moment, the carriage would instantly go into the castle. castle. And there's stuff that happens. That yep. When that happens, we haven't talked about it yet, but we will. Um, that's Guy. What about Prince John, Jeb? He goes on the road and removes silver equal to the number of barricades on that road, and they go to the supply. So, if he goes over here... I count the barricades, one, two, yes, you count the one that's always there. He's always going to get at least one. And then that, in this instance, it would take off two silver. And where did you say it goes? To the supply. So and it just off gets the off the board. All right, and then it also says that if the space that the villain is placed has a hero uh, before the villain is placed, the hero has to pay a distraction or else... Uh, flip the hero card and they cannot use their ability next hero phase. Oof, that's awful. Uh, that can happen just because of the turn order. Because I'll go first and then when Jeb flips a villain card, if a villain moves to the same spot where I left my hero phase, right. that's what's going to happen. And also, if you decide to move a hero into a space with a villain, you have to pay the distraction or else you can't move into that space. After you place the villain, uh, you're going to do the activate the road, so that's the last part on right. the card. So look at the card, and there's a wagon, and it says south. Yep, so there's four roads, each corresponding to a direction. Uh, when you activate it, every carriage passes one barricade and stops at the next one, or else it enters the castle. Right. So which, did you get south? Yes, I did. Alright, so right south there. is here. So it's currently in front of a barricade, so it, it, since it activates, this hops over the barricade, and it would just keep going until it hits another one, but there's not another one. So it goes into the castle. So the next thing you do is add a new carriage to the starting position of that road. So he so, randomly pulls one out of the bag. Stuck together. <laughs> Alright, so the new one is placed at the very end of the road behind that barricade, and then now we resolve the carriage that entered the castle. So what happens is you are going to place the carriage that entered the castle on the top left space of the carriage lot. Which is, uh, this is the carriage lot. There's a picture of a carriage. Can't miss it. Also, it has uh, which rows are used based on the number of players. So we're going to have two players. So we use the first column, which always gets used and the second column, which is one or two players. So we're going to use these two columns. That's important because same thing. If these fill up, we're in trouble. Right. So you're going to place it in the top left. Not lose, though. Just that whole... Yeah, there's a tax There's an surge. explosion, which yeah. might as well be losing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so it goes right there. All right. And then I look at the space that it went on, and it has... Jeb, it has one silver coin. What happens? You are going to take a <laughs> silver coin from that road... Uh, the, the stack next to the road and just put it off in the supply. If, oh, you, if you lose a stack of silver, game is over. One thing I wanted to point out is when you place the carriage on that track, you place it standing up because there are times where it's going to be on its side and that matters. So It really did. <laughs> this is one of the... the that's a, this, what he just talked about is actually one of the more complicated things in the right. game that when it happens, you'll probably... Pull out the rule book and right. do it step by step. But anyways. Um, All right. So that, that was placing it. Uh, if, do you want to talk about the tax upsurge? Uh, I do, but I also want to uh, take uh, this barricade, put it in on that slot, and then just show the movement if there was a barricade there. All right. So if Mickey activated this road, uh, we would hop the barricade and then move. Yep. Oh, it stops. Right. So just... That, that's what it meant by hop the barricade, drive to another barricade. I just wanted you guys to get yeah. a visual. Not that you're stupid, but just, to reinforce just so it. you can visually see it. Actually, we didn't talk about if a second carriage enters, where do you place it on that track? The next one down. Yep. So 
you start top left working your way down. When you fill the column, you do the next column from the top working your way down. And notice that this one takes two coins. Two coins. All right, so when a tax upsurge activates is when all of the spaces are filled for however many player counts. So let me let me give a visual, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put some down here. So I'm going to go I'm going to say we robbed two carriages and the rest made it to the castle. Remember, robbed ones go on this side. Yep. And this is, again, this is set up so you guys can get a visual. All right, continue. What do I do, Jeb, all now right, that so it's full? First thing you do is count all the robbed carriages. I have two robbed carriages. All right, then you remove all of the carriages and, and what do I do place with them? them back in the bag. All right. So next, you are going to execute road activations equal to the number of robbed carriages. Which we just counted as two. Yep. So you, the way, the order that you activate the roads is by the stack with the... Most. Most pennies. So... So at least they're a little bit nice to right. you. <laughs> so in this case, like, I think all these have the most so we would just pick one right. and then activate the carriage on the road right. like so normal. like this one has six if this was the case we just you know, it's just it's jumping zooming into the castle so guess what there it's already starting to fill the thing back up it's yep. going to take one we go over to that one that has six hops makes it into the castle have to put it on the track and this instantly two. and that one loses two and and then they immediately fill back up with new carrot those are instantly going to get two new Carrots. two new buggies and that's why tax up surge is bad yep all right so there you go that's what a tax up surge uh looks like so and that's not good yeah that's that's the end for just resolving a villain card so all that stuff can happen from a villain card right after you resolve the villain card uh you get to move your hero twice and what they call a move is technically a move and an action. So Mickey would take his Robin Hood hero and he would get to move it to any of the locations that Mickey he could will try to rescue Jeb even though the sheriff is there. I will need to rescue Jeb. All the right. sheriff's there. I will throw away a distraction so I can come with you, Jeb. Thank you. All right. All right. So what Mickey is doing is fighting guards. So he placed his hero in that area. He's going to choose one guard in the area. So there's actually four of them. He can choose which one he wants to fight. This one that's holding you captive, Jim. All right. So at this point, I'm going to fight the guard. So as many dice, weapons dice that I've acquired over the round, I'm allowed to use in this, at, uh, in this battle. Okay. This is where what you drafted comes into play because the dice that you use need to match one of the dice over there or both of them because it's also important to decide how many you want to roll so in this case I can use brown dice so we're gonna pretend I have brown dice and I have a green die so I can actually use them both here's where the decision um, is important if I roll both dice at the end of the turn I'm gonna lose both dice if I roll one and I get a hit, then I still have this to use later. So if I roll, if I do that, I got a hit, a hit, miss. and a miss. All right. So Jeb would be rescued, and I get the loot. Yes, I do. That does not go back to him. Both of these dies go back into the supply. What happens with the rescued guy is it goes back to Jeb, and it goes in his training ground, and the guard goes back into the supply. So unfortunately, you don't get to hold the guard for ransom in this case, but you did clear out a spot. So that helped a little bit. This Mickey what? also gets a victory point. I get, I get a... Uh, uh, since it was not his meeple that he rescued. So I go up one on the victory point. And he gets one reputation for uh, defeating the guard. Right. Now, if it was... If I saved myself... I believe you still get the reputation, yep. but no victory point. Correct. Okay, so that's a little nuance there that you might forget, but just right. remember, uh, you, 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 don't, you got yourself captured, so you don't get a victory point right. for uncapturing yourself. <laughs> I guess that's the best way to, to do it. If you fail on both die, which I didn't talk about, they just come back and go in, 
into uh, into your supply. You don't lose any die if you whiff, so to speak. And then it says that you must move your hero out of the space if you have another movement. Mm -hmm. right. If this is your last move for that hero, he just sits, sits there sits and that's there. it. Right. Um, so again... Uh, and then there's one other thing. Uh, Mickey had two dice. If he decided to roll one and got a success and he rescued my guy, he could continue and roll another dice to try to pick off another guard. And he could do that with... All in the same action. That right. was what I was trying to get at, which Jeb did better than me, with why you really need to decide how you want to use yeah. the, the die. Because once you whiff, it turns over also. Right. Or, I mean, you have to move off or whatever. So... There's a little bit of strategy in how lucky you're feeling. There are some cards that offer re-rolls and stuff, so um, that's good. And also, your distraction tokens can be used at re for re-rolls, which is super important, especially with what we just said, because I would be like, oh crap, I used one die. Let me throw a distraction and hope I can continue to possibly pick off some other guards to open up uh, some spaces and or get victory points. But again... A lot of stuff to keep in mind, so yep. remember, that's basically how that works. All of these areas work the same way with plucking off the guards. Yep. So there are some other hero actions. What do you want me to talk about next, Jed? Uh, how about I was dumb and got one of my meeples put in prison. So how about you break me out? All right. So I, I can go over to uh, the prison here. I think there's, yep, there it is. I was looking for the symbol to show you. So, yep. heroes can go over there. Woo! And what you do is you pay distraction tokens, and you gain two dice for each distraction token that you pay. So, so when Mickey enters, uh, when he moves his hero over here, the first thing he does is pay distraction tokens to gain skill dice. For each distraction token he pays, he gets two skill dice, to a maximum of six skill dice. Okay, so uh, since you're in level two, Jeb, how many skills am I going to need to get you out? Uh, to get me out, you are going to need... You need one success for one guard, and the deeper levels make it more difficult. So, right. so level one, one guard. Level two has two guards. Yep. Level three has three guards. So I'm not feeling like just a f that two dice is going to do it for me, so... Well, all I have is one because I spent another one. Um, but let's just pretend that I'm going to put in two distraction tokens. That would buy me four die. Then I would just roll the die and hope that I get two successes, which wow, I just I barely did. It's a good thing I bought two because who would have said, known for sure if I would have got that. All right. That. Now what happens if I rescue you, Jeb? Okay, you are going to collect from the sheriff's staff Woo. stash based on the level. So since it was level 2 rescue, I, I believe you get two items out of the stash. You can take whatever I want. Since I'm low on distractions, I'll go ahead and take two distractions. Uh, then you gain victory points if the prisoner is somebody else. For the um, levels when you rescue, this is how it goes. Level 1, two victory points and one of the sheriff's possession. Hmm. Level 2, I get three victory points, two possessions. And level three, I get four victory points and three possessions from okay. the sheriff. That's the payoff, and that is um, you get no victory points if you rescue yourself. Again, you were stupid. You got yourself captured. But I rescued Jeb, so I get... And the meeple is going to go to the training ground right. since he got so rescued. So that would have given me three, one, two, three victory points. All right, if Mickey had failed... Like before, he would just have to leave this area. He couldn't attempt it again. Right, so no big penalty or anything for failing, right. so to speak. You want to do a rob the carriage on a road? Sure. Action? So if Mickey had decided to place his Robin Hood by that road, mm -hmm. uh, what he's going to do is roll a minimum of two dice matching the carriage color minimum yes so robbing a carriage actually costs you more resources to do it because i can't do one at a time and the colors of the die have to match the carriage right. so if you that's i'm just bringing over brown dice because we're doing examples here that's the brown carriage if you can't see it 
And then do I need one or two successes to successfully rob? Must hit once. All right. You can spin distractions to re-roll one die. And I got one. All right. If you succeed, you gain a reputation. So Return boom. all weapons that were used back to the supply. Boom. Lay the carriage on the side. In boom. the lot. Yep. Uh, receive the reward that's listed in the row on the lot. What a cruddy reward. <laughs> I get... I actually got a... It's kind of weird. You get... If you get them in this row, you actually get a better... A better deal. But, hey, a silver is a silver. Then barricade owners on the road get two victory points per each barricade they own. So, so if if Jeb had a, a see, barricade... Well, if I had one, yep. then I would get how two many? Two, two victory points. Two per barricade. Right. And then you are able to ambush another carriage on the road if There's you enough. have the resources to do so. Okay. If you fail, however, you return all the weapons that you used. and Oh, no, you keep the weapons that you used, and uh, you have to move away if you have another movement. So. Yeah. So, uh, in, in terms of the barricades, I know this is a little off topic, if... Uh, You've been paying attention in terms of the barricades. Just want to point out real quick. You'll notice that the only time that they go away is when we showed you when Grisborne lands on a spot. I just wanted to point that out because you might be wondering. That, like, we didn't take it off when the something jumped over. That doesn't right. come off then. It doesn't... If I rob a carriage, they don't come off. They only come off when he does his thing, um, which isn't... You know, basically, it's important because if they were coming off all the time, it'd be really, it'd yeah. be tough to keep these things under control. So, anyways, uh, that was just an aside. Sorry, I got on a tangent, but I wanted to point that out in case anybody was wondering. Right. So, what do we got next, Jeb? Where here we the can go? Archery competition. All right, archery competition. You can see up here the archery competition. Uh, the it does have a star, so the, evidently the sheriff can go there. I forget what he does when he goes there. I guess just looking for heroes, because he can come into a hero spot. Yeah. Um, this works very similar to robbing the rich to feed the poor. I got up to three consecutive competitions. You roll three dice in each of them, but the number of successes needs goes up. Go, goes up. Right, and it's actually... I'm going to uh, point here for a second, take Robin off. So... The number of arrows equals the number of die. So 3, yep. 3, and 3. If you look over at the rob, it's 3, 2, and 1. But if you look at the arrows in the target, which are successive, this goes 1, 2, and 3. Yep. So 3 and, die. And for the successes, you uh, you collect the silver right. reward. And if you fail, you got to leave the competition. Right. So boom, I got a success. I can go, I collect my reward for that competition. I get a silver. And I go on to the next one. So I roll again, all three again. Boom. Whoa! On fire, wow. Jeb. So I collect a coin, and I go to the next one. The problem is I wish that would have happened yeah. on the very last one. So I actually have to do that again to win the last competition. And I missed it by one. But I do get to keep my two silver, and that's the end of um, the end of the competition. And when you lose, you have to move away, or if it's your last move, you're just, you're just sitting it. there. Um, because, like I said, the sheriff can come into that spot. That might be what happens to you. Yep. All right. And then purchase weapons is another thing you can do. Shoo. Which all you do is put your guy up there, and you can purchase weapons or exchange them, I believe, right? So the exchange is any dice for any other dice in here. And to purchase weapons, it's wood or ore, depends on what weapon you can buy. So the staff and the bow cost you a wood, and the uh, axe and the sword cost you um, iron or ore or whatever they call it in this game. Keep in mind, I don't remember if we said it or not, but the maximum you can store of weapons is four at one point in time. And remember, you're always going to draft two so you want to try um, to get two some right. other way the the point of this is kind of like oh i need i might need one more and or i've acquired a bunch but now i don't need that color anymore right like if the carriage okay. is switched exactly. up on you part way through there's you know or somebody else 
If you're playing with yeah. four people and somebody kind of messed up your plan and got to your hero turn, wait a second, I need to switch it up now. Unfortunately, this does use one of your actions, right. so you're only going to be able to do one more thing, which mm, that kind of hinders a little bit, but in order to keep the game state so that you can win, you might need to do it, so it's a nice thing to happen. Right. Uh, is there and anything else? One more. But Give back to the poor. Which is that this spot one, right there. Right here. Yep. And what you do here is you spend silver that goes back to the supply uh, to remove guards. And that's two silver per guard. And you gain two victory points per Time guard removed. Alright, so uh, there I just got these two for the archery contest. So I will pay those. This guard comes out the track. I get two victory points over there. And I think that's all that happens, Jeb said. Yep. <laughs> and if you had more silver, you could take more guards off if you Which, wanted. That's pretty nifty. Yep. So those are all the different things heroes can do. So uh, it's, it's just going to be... Right. And if, if you aren't going, wow, there's a lot oh, yeah. going on in this game yet, then kudos to you because I was kind of like, wow, they covered everything that Robin Hood does. <laughs> yep. So all the players are going to... To, to go through that in player order, they each get two moves for their hero. Once that finishes, it's going to be the end of round. So, this is what you do at the end of the round. First, you can use ransom, use the ransom tile to exchange captives. Okay, now remember, you got the captives from placing traps. Um, so, I have one guard, and I look at the, the sheet. What does one guard give me this time, Jeb? I can't quite see it. It one looks guard. like resources. Ooh. It has two wood and an ore. Right. So if I wanted to, I could give this guard, I would get those supply. If Jeb had a guard, he could do the same thing. We just take them, put it in our, our stash. The trap that was associated with that guard just stays on your player board. Right. Like, you don't, you don't really place it anywhere. It's just kind of... Just it's know that you used it. Because in the end of the game, however many traps you did helps with victory points. This can't be replaced? Right. It's done. Oh, it's they're just done done. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, I didn't know that. Does that is that the same thing for the barricades? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. That's kind of wow, that means other people have to participate. Yeah. Okay, I didn't realize that. I kind of thought like if all of these came off, um I'm glad Jeb pointed that off that I could just if I was able to do that, I don't right. know that you would do that in just five rounds anyways, because there's only five right. things. But I thought, oh, well, maybe then I can put, on, yeah, I gates. can just, like, yeah. use these off to the side, since I've already got all my bonuses right. from underneath. And kept, like, that's, now that you say that, it actually does make more sense. Still learning, still learning this game. All right, after all the ransoms are done, you are going to advance all prisoners in the, the prison. Except in the final round, they do not move down. Right. So if I had a dude in level 2, at the end of the round, he would move down to level 3. Right. Which just makes it harder for him to be rescued. rescued. But the reward's greater, and if there's other stuff going on the board, at least, you don't, you've, at least you've got some time to rescue people if you don't want to go in and do it right then, because right. there's a mess somewhere else. Alright, after the prisoners are advanced, let's say I had a dude here... And there was a guard that had captured me, and I paid that thing. Uh, he's technically arrested, so all arrested merry men would go to level one jail, and the fine goes to the sheriff's staff. Right. So what Jeb had just set up real here, real quick, is an example of being captured by a guard, and no hero rescued him. He's right. still sitting there with his possession. Go ahead, Jeb. So, that goes into level one. This goes into sheriff. And the guard stays right where he is. Yep, and you just resolve that everywhere. Uh, then you're going to return your hero and merryman back to your player. So the hero just goes back to your board. The merrymen go to the training ground. And all your meeples go to the training ground, which is important. Yes, uh, which we don't have that much. Yeah. There. All right. So after you do that, you're going to transfer merrymen from the training ground to the open hideouts on your... Your player board. So, when you unlock that fourth one, it'll have one you'll one. have four for that next round. But remember, there's some ways, there's some things that can happen where right. you just don't. If you've got too many in the jail, or, or if you, and if saves. you've already got your maximum of uh, three, three, 
three people on a quest, right. basically, because you can only score three cards. Right. So There is one thing. If you cannot fill all your hideouts in this step, uh, you take one from prison, but you lose five victory points. Oh, <laughs> ouch. So at least they... Uh, that's awful. Yep. All right. I guess you paid extra to rescue them, huh? Yep. Then you are going to place all your active Merryman cards in a group discard. So everything that's been actively played just gets discarded right. to the... So the example I used, if you guys remember way back when, was going to the woodcutter place. And I did use the activate um, symbol. And so that would just get discarded. Yep. Remember, I could potentially have passive stuff over here. That stays. Right. Uh, then you can discard as many Merryman cards from your hand as you want and refill back up to your max hand size. Right. So we're like, oh, until you unlock the. We fit. hate the way Jeb shuffles, and the way I throw them all away, and yep. then I redraw. Yep. <laughs> then all the villains go back yeah, to the tower. Like so move this guy back to the tower, and then you are going to discard the ransom tile and replace it. So this one had been used up. So we toss it and flip a new one. And that's what's go coming up for the next round. Yep. And then you will, plas you will pass the first player token clockwise and advance the round tracker. So Mickey was first player. He passed it to me. And then the round tracker, which is in the... It was first round hero phase, is now second round merry men phase. phase. And Jeb would get the cool little coin. coin. Yep. And that's everything for around and things to do. One thing we should talk about really quick is the end of the game. Yep. So if there's no silver pennies on one road, so if you lose. This is empty. Yep. Lose. If the guard track is filled. You lose. Lose. All right. If you survive the five rounds. Uh, you are going to score victory points. So the first thing is based on reputation, you get victory points for traps, barricades built, and envoys sent. Okay, so basically what they're talking about is you look wherever, you, there's my marker. I'm only at this one right here. So I would get uh, five victory points for each barricade, four victory points for each trap, Three victory points for each... Envoy. J just that the fact that they're there. Mm -hmm. Okay, that has nothing to do with these. Right. So, keep that in mind, alright? Just as a for instance, if I make it up to here in reputation, though, all of a sudden these victory points go up yep. a little bit for each one. And if for some reason I made it to the top... I get five extra victory points it just for making it to the top. Five victory points if you reach the top of the reputation track. Plus whatever yeah, I had is. going on here. And remember, this isn't this is uh, for um, you look at your tracker here and see how many empty spaces you have right. multiplied by the number of victory points it gives you. Yep. Uh, then you are going to activate your task cards, uh, one per each envoy that you sent. Right. So that's your choice which ones you want to activate. They all have different in-game conditions, and I believe the book has... As, yeah, what you, this is... I, I'm not even going to guess because most of the time when I've guessed in this game yeah. so far, I got it wrong. But here's what some of the things look like. That one gives... Uh, looks like it gives one victory point. Probably per maybe every, for, for every on the north. one still left in the north. Yeah. So that would... When, when I got stuff from wherever it is that you get uh, the coins to put back on a road, I would probably put them all on north all the time. That looks like it has something to do with prisoners. If three points, if there's nobody at a level, maybe. Totally guessing, people. Yeah. And then two victory points probably per something there. So <laughs> I'm not even... It looks like re that's a reputation drag symbol. So I don't know. Maybe it's each level. For every five, that you yeah, or something like that. It's in the book. We're not. They're all right in now. the book. Um, it doesn't. Unfortunately, I feel like there's plenty of room on the card where they could have actually said yeah. it, but they didn't. Um, kind of makes the card look really clean, but makes you go look stuff up. Yeah. So, all right. After you score your task cards, uh, you get one victory point for every three remaining possessions you own. So, I have. This is what I have. In my possessions, even though 
I'm just grabbing from the examples in the game, but I do happen to have three, six, seven, so I would get two more victory points. A group of three, a group of three, and then nothing. Yep. And then for every captured guard that you still have left on your board, you get a victory point. So if you weren't able to spin them for ransom, you'd get victory points in the end. Uh, then you get the printed victory point on your passive Merry Men cards. Okay, so at this point, whatever Merry Men that I had sitting over here, and let's just pretend I had the whole rest of my hand sitting there, right? Pick up these cards, and I look at everything in the corner, and I got whopping zeros on all of them. And you could be saying, I, no, I probably wouldn't have done that to the end of the game. Mickey, why would you have put all those cards over there anyways if they have zeros? Because remember, I can use those passive cards active and I can and I still fill my hand up all the time right. so it's not a bad idea to put stuff that put, looks potentially like I could use it as an active card even if it doesn't have any victory points on it you're just not going to score it at the end of the game there are however can I have that stack Jeb uh ones uh, I don't know if there's anything worth anything higher than that. Just wanted to give you guys a heads up. Looks like um, ones and zeros. it's ones and zeros, so you'd only have to count by ones. <laughs> All right, then you are going to get victory points for sets of matching Merry Men cards in your passive area. So if you can make sets, uh, I believe it's in the rule book how many points you score for sets. So, so like guys the same. Yeah, if you had the same guys in there, you'd get points. And then the very last thing is you lose victory points for each prisoner in uh, in whichever level. So level one, you lose one victory point. Two is two. Three is three. And if he's been hanged, you lose four. Okay. And then once all the victory points are counted up, you whoever has the most was the best. Was the best hero. Yeah. Basically. Because remember... None of that means a hill of beans if you let this fill up yeah. or if you let one of those run out. Um, and if you were watching, you can kind of see how easy it is to start losing stuff. And if you can't visualize that, just watch round or two of this game and watch the stuff come out. And imagine it with four people. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we'll be back with gameplay.